Okay, so we talked about civil liberties, and now we're going to talk about civil rights. So remember, those are two different concepts that a lot of people tend to confuse. So again, civil liberties are limitations of government power designed to protect freedoms. Civil rights are constitutional guarantees that the government and all government officials will treat people equally, regardless of whether they belong to a protected class. So protected classes are things such as race, gender, ethnic origin, religion, age, things that pretty much think about a disability. Think of it as things that you can't change. They're immutable characteristics, right? That we have a right to not be discriminated against. So a lot of the civil rights stuff comes from the Equal Protection Clause that says that no state shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of laws. You know, what the courts have said, because remember we de depend on the judiciary and the Supreme Court to you know, interpret a lot of this for us. They've told us that, you know, the equal protection clause means that all persons similarly circumstanced must be treated alike. So similarly situated individuals are treated similarly. Say that three times fast, guys. Um, and this is something that we've really done a crap job as a country doing, but we are getting better. So here is an example of us not doing a good job. This is a school built by the federal government for formerly enslaved people that was burned after being set on fire during a race riot in Memphis, Tennessee in 1866. So here, white Southerners were angry that they were defeated in the Civil War and, you know, they lost their slaves. Um, so they attacked and killed former slaves, destroyed their property, and terrorized Northerners, who, white Northerners, who tried to help the slaves. This is definitely not treating similarly situated people similarly. So discrimination. Discrimination is unjust or prejudicial treatment of different categories of people or things, especially on the grounds of race, age, or sex. Discriminatory laws may infringe on civil rights. So a law has a discriminatory effect or it has discriminatory impact when it results in different treatment for similar individuals. So a law also has a, has a, a law has a discriminatory purpose when it was enacted with the intent to unjustly or prejudicially treat certain people differently. So you have to look at the effect or the purpose of the law. So how does discrimination and equal protection work? So equal protection involves principles of equality, fairness, and freedom from discrimination. But these are limited principles, right? So a lot of these things are you have a right, but your rights are not unlimited. So the law allows some forms of discrimination. For example, the law limits alcohol sales to individuals over 21, but prohibits discrimination based on race. You can also look at, I think the, lot, the lotto is 18 years old. Buying certain types of tobacco is... 18 or 21, for a while there was a ban on them. Spray paint that you had to, you know, be a certain age to get spray paint. These are all okay, you know, limits by the law. So what about equal protection in the courts? So when a law discriminates, the courts look at the purpose of the discriminatory, discriminatory practice in deciding the constitutionality of the law. So there are different levels of scrutiny that the court looks at and laws involving discrimination against protected classes. Remember those, those are those immutable characteristics, um, specifically race, religion, or national origin, really you know, have the highest level of scrutiny and are often found unconstitutional. So this is an awesome chart. You have the rational basis test. These are your levels of scrutiny. That's the first level. Then you have intermediate scrutiny, and then you have strict scrutiny. So strict scrutiny is going to be cases based on race, ethnicity, national origin, or religion. So there, there must be a compelling government interest that is narrowly tailored and involves the least restrictive means. So here, the burden of proof is on the government to demonstrate a compelling government interest is at stake, and no alternative means are available to accomplish its goals. That is why a lot of you know cases involving discrimination based on these characteristics, they're overturned and they're thrown out because it's hard to prove. Then you have what's called intermediate scru scrutiny, which is substantially related to an important government objective. 
the standards used by this have been for gender and sex discrimination. You know, a long time ago, you know, women weren't allowed in the military. Typical things. Of note, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she actually, you know, kind of came on the scene by doing a reverse gender discrimination case in which a man was actually discriminated against for trying to, you know, provide care for his mother, I believe. So that movie on the basis of sex kind of covers that. The burden of proof here is on the government, again, to de demonstrate the important governmental interest in treating people differently. Then our lowest level of scrutiny is a rational basis test. And that is something that is rationally related to legitimate government interest. Standards are used by the court to decide most forms of discrimination, basically anything not listed in the intermediate or strict scrutiny category. So the burden of proof for this is on the challenger of the law. And they have to show that there's no good reason for treating them differently than other citizens. Okay. So you have this idea of affirmative action, and that consists of government programs and policies designed to benefit members of groups historically subject to discrimination. These policies seek to address inequalities resulting from longstanding discrimination and improve opportunities for historically excluded individuals and groups. So most affirmative action programs target educational and employment opportunities. It should be noted in the last U.S. Supreme Court session, there was a case involving Asian students suing, uh, I believe it was Harvard, and they argued that because they were not being admitted to school when they had super high grades, super high GPA, because Harvard was trying to get a diverse student body, and they were, you know, apportioning certain seats for people of different, you know, ethnicities. And so the Supreme Court did recently rule in the last few months that race cannot be a primary factor in deciding college admi admissions. What can be done, though, is when you write your personal statement, if you have been affected by racism or discrimination based on your race and have overcome it, you can use that story, but they can't primarily use race for a selection. And if anyone's interested in the case name, just shoot me an email. Then we have the reconstruction amendments. So in the last lecture, we covered the first 10. And then in the Reconstruction Amendments, these are a lot of our civil rights amendments. So the Reconstruction era is the, the, era, the era after the Civil War from 1865 to 1877. And that's where, you know, the Confederates were being reorganized prior to becoming part of the United States again. So these amendments were intended to prevent states from enacting what were called Black Code laws. And these deprived former slaves of their rights and liberties. So first we have the 13th Amendment. So the 13th Amendment says, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for a crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. The 13th Amendment ended the long-standing conflict between slaveholding and non-slaveholding states by abolishing and prohibiting slavery and involuntary servitude across the United States. So if you want to talk about the 13th Amendment, just remember it said no slavery. It is important to note, though, that we don't have you know slavery like we did back in the civil rights era, but we do have a lot of human trafficking plaguing our country, which is a form of slavery. I do encourage you all to go see that movie, um, The Sound of Freedom. I had to struggle for a minute to uh, see that. If anyone has seen The Sound of Freedom and sent me a summary or you know, what they saw in the movie, or you go see it, I will offer extra credit. I am placing this in the middle of the lecture just to make sure everyone's listening. Um, yeah. So the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment, it's long, there's a lot. Pretty much, I think, any kind of constitutional issue going on, you can argue due process of the 14th Amendment. I'm not going to insult you by reading this to you because it's super long, but it does mean that um, national and state citizenships of former slaves prevented states from discriminating against citizens of other states. You had an implied right to travel and extended due process requirements to states. Remember how we talked about with civil liberties or the incorporation of the amendments, you know, via the due process clause to the states and promised equal protection under the law. But then we have equal protection of the law, and we, but then we move into the Jim Crow era. 
So despite the protections of the 14th Amendment, the courts have upheld several discriminatory laws. One of the first landmark cases was Plessy versus Ferguson dealing with uh, railroad cars. The Supreme Court ruled that separate but equal racial segregation was okay under the you know, equal protection clause. So in this, you know, at racial segregation, both based on, you know, the railroad, pro, railroad railroads. Um, and in the Jim Crow era, you saw that in any kind of public transportation. So accordingly, states and municipalities passed what became known as Jim Crow laws. And those laws promoted racial segregation and undermined black voting rights. What I am going to send you guys is the Louisiana voting test. It was a test that was given during the Jim Crow era, and it has nothing to do with voting, has no nothing tangentially related to voting, but it is um, what was used to try and prevent African Americans from voting. So we had this idea of disenfranchisement. Jim Crow era laws sought to disenfranchise minorities, including African Americans. So disenfranchisement uh, disenfranchisement is the revocation or impediment of an individual's right to vote. This is what I was talking about when I was talking about, you know, these practices. So the literacy test, about the voting rights test. Literacy test, they required the voter to read a passage of text and answer questions. But what about illiterate whites? You know, they were allowed under this idea of a grandfather clause simply because they were white. And then before the vote, you know, the tests were implied, they were allowed to still vote, even though your ballot you had to read. Understanding tests. Those included reading passages and explaining them or answering questions about citizenship or U.S. history. You know, one thing I look at when people study for, you know, the citizenship exams, things like that, right? They know so much more of our American history and even how our government works. That's why I love teaching this class because I like to teach you how our government works because so many don't know it. Then we had poll taxes, and those had to be paid in order to vote. If you had no money, you couldn't vote. Well, that is a huge civil rights violation. And then there was white-only primaries that excluded minority voters from participation. Okay, these are all you know things that we have done. So here is a receipt that someone paid their one dollar poll tax. Um, going back to discrimination, you know. It's important to note that we do have multiple civil rights acts, and one of them still has to be ratified every year by Congress. And that is because in some areas of the South, the U.S. Attorney's Office actually is still involved in making sure that um, African Americans and other marginalized communities are allowed to uh, vote. So some of this issue still does happen. Then we have segregation. And that refers to a system of laws and practices that keep different groups apart. We have different types of segregation. The first is called de facto segregation, and that is a private choice. Now, de jure, uh, that is from governmental discrimination laws that foster it. So under Plessy, the standard was separate but equal accommodations. But then we have segregation laws and practices, as well as the provision of state and local resources that are favoring and benefiting whites. So one thing that I think is important to note is that when we're in a society, there's always going to be, an, you know, one party that has, there's always going to be an unequal balance of power, right? There's always going to be one party that is over the other. That's just kind of how society's made. And it's just how we, how we, how we act and how we deal with it. So here are some pictures that I think it's important to see, you know, what history, the 1957 was not that long ago. You know, many of you, your grandparents were alive then. And, you know, here there's Little Rock's all-white Central High School. You know, they were trying to integrate it. And the, uh, the 101st Airborne had to escort the African-Americans to class. Here's a, about the Edmund Pettus Bridge. This is, you know, the police attack. I remember it Bloody Sunday. And then here's one of the civil rights leaders, John Lewis, when he, they took his body across. You know, the civil rights movement was was an era that people it was a, it was a hard it was a hard fight that they had to fight. So the African American civil rights movement. So after World War II, the most famous example of segregation: segregated schools, separate accommodations, and public transit, 
and the exclusion of col persons of color from commercial establishments were the first areas targeted by civil disobedience in direct action campaign during the civil rights movement. Uh, these campaigners often faced tough and sometimes violent local and law enforcement opposition. Uh, my grandmother told me about going to Georgia. She grew up in California. And how in California, there was actually very little African-American people. And then she went to Georgia and there's a water fountain. And she got a drink. She was thirsty. And her cousins pulled her away and told her, you can't use that water fountain. She said, why? Because it's for colored people. She did not understand. She had never been exposed to that out here. Out here, I would think more of the discrimination was towards Hispanics, um, but in the South, it was bad. Then we have the idea of Brown versus Board of Education. Brown v. Board is a really important landmark case um, dealing with, with schooling, right? That's where the school says separate but, un, separate but equal is inherently unequal. Um, you know, yes, it ended, but it ended segregation in schools, but that did not happen overnight. States and school districts, those are those are local entities, think of federalism, they are, that were under the Supreme Court's you know, order. And they had they had chances to fight these segregation plans, and it took over two decades. And remember the Democratic presidential debates, you know, Kamala Harris actually spoke about Joe Biden, who was in the Senate at the time. Um, well, probably, you know, around this time, during this time, um, saying that. If she was a little girl that had to be bused to other schools, and he was trying to ban the busing. And so there's a lot going on there. Then we have the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This outlawed government discrimination and the unequal application of voting qualifications by race. And it also prohibited discrimination on the basis of race, ethnicity, religion, sex, or national origin by your employer and created the EEOC. Which is the Equal Opportunity Employment Com Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to enforce the law. So if you guys ever are facing any kind of discrimination like that, you can apply at the federal level for for help, but you can also apply within the California Department of Fair Housing and Employment for a FIHA claim. Um, so impacts of the civil rights movement. So it was a legacy of past civil rights struggles and influenced future movements. You know, there was movements to abolish slavery and aid immigrant populations, influences the women's suffrage movement, which in turn influenced voting rights work during the civil rights movement. And the African-American struggle for civil rights influenced movements champion the rights of Native Americans, Chicanos and Latinos, the LGBTQIA plus individuals and immigrants. So there's been a lot of communities that have had to fight for their rights. So we're gonna start with the women's suffrage movement. So this is important to me because it was only 1920, that was 103 years ago, that women were actually allowed to vote. Which if you think about it, that's crazy. That's not that long ago in the span of history. The movement for women's suffrage began campaigning in the mid-1840s for women's right to vote. It took all that long, 1920 to 1840. That's almost 100 years of fighting. 80 years of fighting. Some Western municipal, municipalities, territories, and states did allow women to vote in local elections. But, you know, women couldn't participate in all elections until the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Despite saying that the rights of citizens of the U.S., you know, shall not be denied or abridged, but, you know, the 19th Amendment largely extended that vote to white women because of the issues that were going on, you know, in the civil rights movement with the disenfranchisement laws. Okay, so then we go to another category that's had a lot of struggles, and that's Native American civil rights. So, remember, yeah, you know, they were here first. So, Native Americans were forcibly removed from the Eastern US along the Trail of Tears from 1831 to 1838. Over the next century, as we expanded westward, these groups increasingly lost their lands and sovereignty while being excluded from US citizenship. So, remember, we wanted to change the Indians, we wanted to make them more like the white man. We had schools where they, you know, were kept, we had all these things. In 1924, the Indian Citizenship Act granted citizenship to all Native Americans born after its passage. Older Native Americans who had not secured citizenship through military service became citizens under the Nationality Act of 1940. After naturalization, Native Americans faced the same segregation and disenfranchisement laws as African Americans. This was another group that we've done a lot of wrong to. But, 
you know, they are benefiting now with these casinos, at least in California. Um, U.S. courts repeatedly declined to extend many of the constitutional liberties and rights to reservations. Um, so these reservations are pretty much held in trust by the federal government, and the, the tribe helps, the tribe runs, you know, federal land, federal land. So like over here, we have Sherman Indian School in Riverside. You know, to work there, it's a federal job. So, um, you know, the Indian Civil Rights Act extended to the reservations many of the civil liberties and civil rights guaranteed in the Bill of Rights and other of our amendments. Then in the 70s, we have the American Indian Movement, AIM. Um, they occupied Wounded Knee, South Dakota, which is where one of the massacres had happened. And they demanded the federal government honor past treaties where they failed to perform obligations. It ended up being a 71-day armed standoff with federal law enforcement, where two people died and 15 were injured. It's a serious thing. Other significant civil rights movements. Um, most Asian Americans were excluded from citizenship and naturalization in the U.S. until the 1940s. You know, during World War II, Japanese and Japanese American individuals were ordered into internment camps. I will be posting a video that shows life inside the internment camp. It's kind of it's kind of creepy. Um, you know, the Chinese, we have a lot of Chinese exclusion acts going back and forth throughout history. Uh, Latino and Chicano groups advocated for rights of farm workers and pathways to nationalizations for undocumented workers. It's important to note that we actually brought over a lot of um, Latinos during World War II because a lot of our men were at war fighting. So we needed someone to work the farms. We needed someone to work all the agriculture in California. And then as soon as the war ended and the men came back, then we pushed back and, you know, force them to leave our country. So then we have, so the women's rights movement is different than the suffrage movement, right? The women's rights movement began in the 60s and it was a fight for medical autonomy, privacy, such as legal access to birth control and abortions, the right to keep their surname, their own property, obtain credit in their own name after marriage, which in the 60s they couldn't do, attend certain schools or professions, earn equal pay and combat discrimination. So this was a, a fight with like the Equal Rights Amendment and still to this day, I have nursing students who have explained to me you know, one, at one job, you know, a man and a, a male and a female, both similarly situated, applied for a job and the male was offered more money than the female. So it still happened. But then we have immigrant, immigrant groups. These groups have sought prevention of human trafficking and increased pathways to immigration and citizenship due process and deportation hearings, amnesty, and protection for undocumented children. I will tell you, I teach immigration law to paralegals at Fremont University, and our immigration system is screwed up. Well, we need to completely overhaul it and make it more user-friendly. That's all I'll say because I could go off on that like a um, mother. Um, so this... Um, cartoon shows a Chinese labor and, you know, outside the Golden Gate delivery. That's the Chinese Exclusion Act from the 1882, um, which barred him from entering the country. And I think it's kind of interesting because, you know, we're allowing communists in and nihilists and socialists and hoodlums, but no Chinamen. I think what's kind of interesting, too, is I encourage you guys um, on Amazon, the Man at High Castle. It shows what would have happened if we would have lost World War II. And China basically um, runs the western half of the United States and the Nazis run the eastern half. Definitely an interesting you know, thought process. Here we have a picture of Japanese Americans that were placed in these, in these camps. So these camps were not like nice camps. These camps were actually mostly in the desert. And they had to run and then to stay there till the end of the war, just in case they were, you know, in with the government of Japan. So then we have the LGBTQIA movement. So this starts with, you know, the gay rights movement arose in the 60s after the Stonewall uh, issue where, you know, it was a police um, riot. There's a lot of discrimination laws criminalizing same sex relationships and acts. So until the 60s, all states criminalized same sex sexual acts most prohibited appearing in public in a manner that was deemed to misalign with people of sex assigned at birth. These laws you know, promoted extensive harassment by law enforcement, 
denials of rights, including veterans' rights, and acceptance of assault and discrimination against the LGBTQ plus people. What's interesting is one of the first um, issues of gay rights came in where a soldier, a soldier, sailor, or someone in the military um, came out as gay and they put him in an insane asylum because they thought he was just mentally jacked up. You know, we've done a lot of crappy things in the country, but we have to examine these things so that we can move forward and do better. In 2003, the Supreme Court case, Lawrence versus Texas, declared the um, uh, law regarding sodomy illegal or unconstitutional. And there in Texas, uh, sodomy was illegal and forcible sodomy is, but uh, two gentlemen, I guess their neighbors observed them having um, you know, homosexual relations and called the police and they had to fight for that. So in 2015, under Obergefell versus Hodge, um, we have same-sex marriage across the United States being legalized. And in 2020, we ruled that, you know, we can't use sexual orientation or gender expression as a form of discrimination in employment and related institutions. I do think, of, you know, forecasting things out, I do think that a lot of our civil rights and civil liberties issues are going to fall in this area with gender expression. But I guess that's for us to see in the future, right? All righty. Thank you for watching. Reach out if you have any questions.